Right. So we are recording. So welcome everybody. Um, so just to kind of review again, this is kind of here, you know, all the time, but um, we do have a couple of um, quizzes that are due by tomorrow night. Um, deadlines for everything is 1159. Um, I don't write that on there, but um, you know, so you have all day tomorrow. Um, the first one is just an academic integrity quiz, um, pretty easy. And the second one is a getting ready for this course quiz. It's kind of just practicing uploading work um, to make sure you know how to do all of that before um, your first uh, assessment. Um, you have a couple of labs that you need to um, consider um, as well. Um, there's a lab that's due tomorrow night. Um, it's a paper lab on uh, Lewis structures and molecular geometry. It's a review from uh, Chem 1. Uh, and we talked in the last class about how the lecture notes from Chem 1 are on Canvas all the way down at the bottom. So um, if you need a refresher on Lewis structures, you can always go back and look at that. Or you can go onto the online textbook if, if you need that as well. Um, on Monday, you have two labs that are due. Neither of them require the um, lab kit. Um, the first one is a getting started lab, and um, the second one is a lab safety um, lab. And then you have some homework um, that's due um, Monday by 11.59. Um, the first one is on chapter 10. Um, there are four sections on that, and we're just about done with all the content from chapter 10. We have a little bit more we need to do. And then um, part of chapter 11 um, is also due um, on Monday for homework. So we um, have talked about um, what's called intermolecular forces. And those are the forces that hold atoms or molecules together when the substance is in a condensed state, when it's a solid or a liquid. And there are three different types of intermolecular forces. Uh, London dispersion forces or London forces are the weakest that are formed from nonpolar atoms or molecules that um, form instantaneous dipoles and the attraction between those um, instantaneous dipoles between atoms and molecules. Then we have um, dipole-dipole intermolecular attractions, which are ones that form between molecules that um, have a polarity, that um, do have a dipole moment to them. And then we have uh, the strongest are hydrogen bonding. Can they use that word bonding in there? It's probably not the best term to put in there because it is an intermolecular force, not an intramolecular bond. And hydrogen bonding is the strongest of the three intermolecular forces. So if we can draw a Lewis structure for um, a molecule, we can then decide whether that molecule is polar or nonpolar. And that'll help us to decide the type of intermolecular forces that'll hold those molecules together. And then based on the strength of that intermolecular force, we can rank things based on their um, physical properties like um, freezing point and vapor pressure and um, boiling point, um, things that um, we can um, use to describe matter. So if we want to identify the substance that has the highest freezing point, that means it's gonna have the strongest intermolecular forces. And when we look at our choices here, hydrogen chloride is a polar molecule. So it has dipole-dipole um, uh, intermolecular attractions. Whereas argon and fluorine are nonpolar, so they only have London dispersion forces. Since dipole-dipole intermolecular attractions are stronger, you would have a higher freezing point in, in between HCl molecules than you would argon and fluorine. Uh, when we talk about vapor pressure, okay, vapor pressure um, is um, kind of indirectly related to the strength of the bonds. The weaker the bonds, the higher the vapor pressure. The stronger the bonds, the lower the vapor pressure. Because 
if you have strong intermolecular forces that are holding molecules together, it's going to require more energy for them to become a vapor. Therefore, their vapor pressures are going to be lower. So lowest vapor pressure, well, chlorine, bromine, and iodine are all nonpolar diatomic molecules. So they all have London dispersion forces. But the strength of the London dispersion forces is directly related to the number of electrons that you would find in that atom or molecule. The more electrons there are, the more polarizable the molecule would be, and the stronger the um, London dispersion force would be. So we're basically moving down the periodic table through the halogens when we go from chlorine to bromine to iodine. Iodine has more electrons. It's more polarizable. So its London forces are stronger. So it's less likely that those molecules are gonna be going from a liquid to a gas. So you would have a lower vapor pressure. Okay, the last one um, asks about the lowest boiling point. Well, lowest boiling point means the weakest intermolecular forces, okay? So hydrogen, nonpolar, so that's London dispersion forces. Sodium chloride, that's ionic, okay? That's gonna have the strongest um, intermolecular interparticle forces. And then hydrogen fluoride, um, is um, hydrogen bonding because you've got um, hydrogen bonded to fluorine within the molecule. So you're going to have fairly strong dipole, dipole intermolecular attractions, and we just call that hydrogen bonding. But we want the weakest, the weakest would be hydrogen. Good. So quick review of um, intermolecular forces and how we can use them to rank um, properties of, of um, matter. Okay. Anybody have any questions before we move on to some new stuff? We got a couple of things we need to do to kind of wrap up chapter 10. Um, could you go over the lowest vapor pressure yep. rules one more time? Yep. So lowest vapor pressure is the pressure that um, a gas exerts above a liquid. So if we have a liquid and it's in a closed container, some of the particles are going to have enough energy to change from a liquid to a gas. And that gas would be above the liquid phase. And those gas particles would be exerting a pressure. Okay, that pressure is what we call vapor pressure. So the more um, gas particles you have, the higher the vapor pressure. So if you look at intermolecular forces that are weak, it's easier for the particles to become a gas and you'd have a higher vapor pressure. If you have stronger intermolecular forces, it's harder for those particles to become a gas and your vapor pressure would be less. Does it help? Yes, it does, thank you. You're welcome. Um, there was a question about where the recordings are. We looked on Canvas um, on, in the first class and when you go through the modules, um, after um, each section, after each module, I guess, um, there's a section that says extra support videos or something like that. And that's where um, I put those um, recordings. So they're in there with those extra support videos. So hopefully that's helpful. All right. So we um, talked about um, energy and adding energy in to change um, phases. And another way that we can look at um, that is by looking at what are called phase diagrams. So this is an example of a phase diagram. It's a graphical way to summarize the conditions that you would have for a solid, a liquid, or a gas for a substance. And generally speaking, you're going to see solids here because you're looking at lower temperatures and higher pressures that would typically make something a solid. You would have gases here because you're looking at higher temperatures and lower pressures. So that's likely to be a gas. And then a liquid would be somewhere in between. So if we were to change the temperature or pressure conditions, 
to go from here to here, we're looking at melting because we're going from a solid to a liquid. So this line represents the melting of a substance. And if we were to go from here to here, we're going from a liquid to a solid, so it would represent freezing. Okay, if we were to go from here to here, now we're going from a liquid to a gas. So this line represents vaporization. And if we were to go from here to here, we're going from a gas to a liquid. So this line would represent condensation. Now, we talked about how sometimes substances skip the liquid state altogether. Okay, that would be maybe something that would happen down ar around here. So if we had a substance going from a solid to a gas, we're looking at sublimation. Or if we were to go from a gas to a solid, we'd be looking at deposition. And this graph is just a, a graphical way to kind of summarize the pressure and temperature conditions for substances in a solid state versus a liquid state versus a gaseous state. Now, a couple other um, points of notice on the graph. Okay, we've got this point here, which is called our critical point. And the critical point is um, the point at which, um, if we were to go above that um, section, we have a substance that's got kind of a mixture of liquid and gas characteristics. Okay, we call this part up here, the substance would be classified as a supercritical liquid. And we, we essentially don't have much of a distinction between the liquid and the gas state when we're up in along here above our critical point. And matter at these conditions, these pressure and temperature conditions, have density characteristics that are like a liquid, but they can flow more like a gas. Okay, they tend to fill the container you put them in. So this is our critical point. And above that point, we have what we call our supercritical fluid. Now, another note of um, interest in a phase diagram is this point here. And this point here is called your triple point. And when we look at the triple point, it's the temperature and pressure where all three states of matter will exist at the same time. So you'll have an equilibrium between the solid, liquid, and gas state when you're at the triple point. Okay, so when we look at these kinds of graphs, they are pressure, temperature um, conditions for solids, liquids, and gases. Low temperatures and high pressures are solids. Low pressure and high temperature are gases in between our liquids. And then the lines between the phases will give us those phase changes. Now, just to give you an example of you know, where this might be used, um, that super critical. Um, point is used um, to um, um, remove caffeine from coffee um, by using supercritical carbon dioxide. Okay, just to kind of give you a, you know, why, why do I need to even know that? So there's kind of a, an everyday purpose for um, that supercritical fluid. So once again, the critical point is like where the point at which like it becomes a supercritical fluid. Yes, after? above that point is where you're looking at the supercritical fluid. Yep. So this section here, anywhere above this temperature and anywhere above this pressure is where the substance will kind of have characteristics of a liquid and a gas, and we call okay. it the supercritical fluid. Okay, yep. thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So let's look at water, because water is um, a little bit different in the way that its um, phase diagram looks. Because for most phase diagrams, this line here between the solid and the liquid phase has a positive slope. Okay, it goes this way. But 
for water, the slope is a negative slope, okay? And that essentially means that um, if you apply pressure to ice, it's going to melt, okay? If you were to increase, the, like if we have ice here and we increase the pressure, it's going to turn to a liquid, okay? That's different than what happens for pretty much every other substance. So why does that happen? Well, think about the effect of pressure on density, okay? If we were to increase the pressure, that would um, decrease the volume, which would increase the density. But water is backwards, okay? We know that ice floats in liquid water because it's less dense. So it's backwards of what most substances are. So if we were to look at this line, we're looking at a negative slope, meaning that if we had um, ice, solid water, at let's say these conditions here, and we don't change the temperature, but we increase the pressure, that's going to cause a substance to melt. It's going to cause it to go from a solid to a liquid. Just a little bit of a, a difference between the phase diagram for water and, and other substances. So here's a question, okay? We um, have a phase diagram for water and we wanna use that to determine what state water will be in at these conditions. So the state of matter isn't just dependent on temperature, it's dependent on temperature and pressure. Changing the pressure can also cause phase changes. So negative 10 degrees Celsius and 50 kilopascals. Okay, so we would wanna find that on the graph, figure out where we are and find out what phase. Would it be a solid? Would it be a liquid? Or would it be a gas? Okay, so I'll give you a couple quick minutes. Go through that graph. See if you can identify what phase our water will be in at those conditions. all come up at once, which is unfortunate. Oop, I do. All right, so I'll give you another minute. I should have made it come up one at a time, but that's okay. All right, so let's see how we did. Oops. Okay, and again, it's just reading a graph. We just have to know, maybe you'd see a question where it doesn't label you know, solid, liquid, gas, and you'd have to know that that's what the states would be. So um, maybe this is a little easier than what you might see. So negative 10 degrees would be in along here, 50 kilopascals is around here, so we're looking at a solid. Okay, 25 degrees Celsius is in along here. 90 um, kilopascals is kind of up along here. So we're looking at a liquid. Um, 50 degrees Celsius and 40 kilopascals. Okay, we're looking at a liquid. Again, a little bit hard for us to tell where, where that is, but pretty close. Um, 80 degrees Celsius and one kilopascal makes it a uh, gas. Negative 10 and 0.6 makes it a solid, 50 and 0.3 makes it a gas. Good enough? All right, so let's look at one more type of question like this and then we'll move on. So we have a um, phase diagram. Now we know, even though it's not labeled, we know that this is not water because it's showing that positive slope 
Okay, again, water shows a negative slope, but we've got a positive slope, okay? Things aren't labeled this time, okay? So we need to figure out what phase things are gonna be in, okay? It tells us it's oxygen, it doesn't really matter what the substance is, but it tells us that's what it is. All right, so when we get the last one filled in, because I do want to give you enough time to kind of figure it out on your own. When you get that last one done, oxygen at one ATM and 65.7 Kelvin, put the answer in the chat just so that I know that we can go over this and move on. Again, I want to give you enough time, but I don't want to spend too, too much time. All right, so it looks like we're good. Wrong buttons all the time. Okay, so if we were to take a look at where these things are, I have things all over the place that I can't control. Okay, um, at a pressure of one atm. Okay, so we're looking at right here, and um, fifty-four point eight kelvin. Okay, so fifty-four point eight is right here. We don't want to say it's just the freezing point, although it is. It's a little bit more specific than that. We're going to call it the normal freezing point because it's at one ATM. So normal boiling point and normal freezing point is um, at one ATM, as opposed to just saying freezing point. You now the freezing point could be anywhere along this line. Okay, so this would be the normal freezing point. Okay, so the normal boiling point. Well, that means then we're looking at one ATM. Boiling point is going from a liquid to a gas. We know that this is the liquid and this is the gaseous phase. So we want this point here. So we would follow it down and the normal boiling point is 90.2 Kelvin. Again, this line here represents the boiling point, but boiling point changes depending on what the pressure is. The normal boiling point is right here at 1 ATM. Okay. And I'm Seeing chats, I just need to get down to them. Oh, yeah, I know. A couple of people are going through storms and losing power and stuff. So we'll do the best we can. Hopefully, I won't lose power. And, and at least we'll have the, the full lecture on, um, on the uh, recording when we're done. So um, you know, we'll, we'll all work the best we can with these crazy storms that are going through here. But thank you for letting me know. Um, OK. Um, so the triple point, we need to know that the triple point is that point where the solid, liquid, and gas all kind of intersect, so that would be here, and it wanted to know the pressure in ATM, so that would be 0 0.00150 ATM, and then um, at temperatures above this value up here, what are we looking at? Okay, that would be our supercritical fluid, so up, you know, past up in here would be our supercritical fluid. Um, fluid. Uh, and then the last question, um, oxygen is what phase at, and it gives us the pressure and the temperature. So we're um, up in here, so it's a gas. And then for the second one, we're in along here, so it's a solid. And the third one, we're in here, so it's a liquid. Okay, everybody feel fairly comfortable with phase diagrams? All right. So we do have to spend a little bit of time, although I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because it's not um, not going to be a major focus for us, but it's stuff we need to talk about. We're going to deal a little bit with um, different types of solids. So when we look at solids, one type we might see is called a crystalline solid. And when we look at crystalline solids, they have a very regular pattern to um, their arrangement. And the pattern um, is made up of what are called um, lattice positions. And the smallest repeating unit 
um, is called a um, unit cell. So we also have what are called amorphous solids. And the prefix a before word means without and morph means shape. So we're looking at solids that, that have a, an amorphous type of a shape, okay? They kind of have a disorder to their structure, okay? Um, they may undergo transitions to become crystalline under appropriate conditions of temperature or pressure. And they have no basic repeating unit or no unit cell. So looking at examples, this is kind of a, a picture depicting a crystalline solid, and this would be more of an amorphous solid. And when we look at crystalline solids, um, talking about um, sodium chloride, that's like a classic example of a crystalline solid or quartz um, is an example of a, a crystalline solid as opposed to um, amorphous ones, um, glass and um, candle wax are two um, less ordered types of solids or amorphous solids. And we're gonna spend just a little bit more time talking about the crystalline solids and the, these um, unit cells. So when we look at a unit cell, okay, a crystalline solid, is described by the simplest repeating unit. And that repeating unit is called our unit cell. And when we look at the unit cell, the points of the unit cell are called our lattice points. So if this is the crystalline solid that we're looking at, okay, this would be the repeating unit or the unit cell. And the unit cell is made up of these points here, which we call lattice points. Now, there are different types of crystalline solids depending on what's found at the lattice points. So if we talk about um, crystalline solids that have um, ions at their lattice points, we call them ionic solids. So as an example, Sodium chloride is a crystalline solid where the sodium ions and the chloride ions are at the lattice points. When we talk about atomic solids, atomic solids are a type of crystalline solid that have atoms at their lattice points. So um, carbon or boron or silicon at these lattice points would be an atomic solid. So having carbon could mean we're looking at diamonds. And there are two types of atomic solids. There are metallic solids, which means that we've got metal atoms at the lattice points, or they can be network covalent solids. And the third type of crystalline solid would be molecular solids. And molecular solids have molecules at their lattice points. So it's pretty easy to, to figure these out. Ionic solids, atomic solids, and molecular solids are all crystalline solids that have those uh, unit cell repeating uh, units within them. And the lattice points are identified by the name of the solid. So ionic solids have ions in them, atomic solids have atoms in them, molecular solids have molecules in them. So let's look at ionic solids in a little more detail. So um, we're gonna be looking at um, ions in the lattice points and they're held together by electrostatic interactions. Essentially what that means are the positive ions are attracted to the negative ions. Ionic solids um, are classified as having high melting points. They're hard and brittle, and they can't conduct an electric current when they're in their solid state. But if we were to melt them, okay, make them molten, or if we were to dissolve them in water to loosen up those ions, then they would be able to conduct an electric current. Okay, so looking at sodium chloride, um, this would be kind of a, a depiction of what that sodium chloride molecule would look like. 
If we were to look at calcium fluoride, um, we've got um, a little bit of a different look to the um, unit cell. And then um, we could look at iron sulfide, um, which is fool's gold, which has an even um, different type of unit cell. So atomic solids, we've got two types. The first type are metallic solids. So that means we've got metals at the lattice points. Okay, um, and the way that they are formed is we have um, metal atoms at the lattice points and the electrons kind of surround those metal atoms. They're delocalized electrons. They're not attached to one atom or identified with one atom. Sometimes it's referred to as like a C of electrons. So the metal atoms are kind of embedded within a C of electrons. And we say that those electrons are delocalized or they're non-directional. So this gives us a little bit different picture here. Um, we've got um, the metal ions here, and then we've got the sea of electrons around them. So those electrons are um, not localized to a particular atom, but they're kind of spread out throughout um, the structure. Okay, metals, um, uh, atomic solids made out of metals with their lattice points um, are very hard and strong, um, but they are malleable and ductile. So malleable means that we can um, kind of spread them out into thin sheets. We can hit them with a mallet and make them nice and thin. Um, ductile means we could draw them out and make wires out of them. And metals are malleable and ductile because of the way that the atoms are arranged in that atomic solid. Okay, their melting points can vary. Some of them are um, higher, some of them are lower, depending on the type of atom and the attraction of those um, ions to the electrons. So the second type of atomic solid are network covalent solids. So when we look at these, we're gonna have atoms at our lattice points. The atoms this time aren't gonna be metals, but they'll be non-metal, something over on the right-hand side of the periodic table. And they're held together by um, networks of covalent bonds. Okay, because the covalent bonds are pretty strong, okay, they typically are hard, strong, and have high melting points. So we have a couple of examples here of atomic solids made out of um, a network of covalent bonds. So diamond might be an example, silicon dioxide is an example, and so forth. So there are a type of atomic solid, but this time the atoms are non-metals which are held together by a network of covalent bonds. Okay, so graphite and diamond are two examples of these network solids. So when we look at graphite, okay, graphite is a planar network solid. Okay, it's flat. It's got six membered carbon rings. So this is kind of an appearance of what graphite might look like. Each carbon atom is bonded to three other carbon atoms. And graphite is good at conducting electricity. Okay, the electrons can easily flow through graphite. And we've got kind of two different things going on. We've got interactions within these planes okay, which are very strong, but then we've got interactions between the planes, which are weak. So if you look at a pencil, okay, a pencil isn't made out of lead, even though they say it's made out of lead. Um, the stuff that we write with out of a pencil is actually graphite, and it's just those um, planes that slide past each other as it writes on the paper. 
So if we look at diamond, okay, diamond is a 3D network of um, carbons, um, six membered carbon rings in um, what's called a chair conformation, but um, you'll see that more when you go into um, organic chemistry, if you take that class in the future. Um, each carbon is bonded to four other carbons. It's denser than graphite because of the way those carbon atoms are arranged. And it can't conduct an electric current because the electrons are localized or they're kind of assigned to specific atoms and they can't flow through the substance. Okay, diamond is very hard because of those network covalent bonds. They're good conductors of heat. And um, they are transparent to visible UV and I, uh, uh, infrared radiation. Now, there are some solids that are one atom thick solids. Graphene is a good example. It's strong, it's lightweight, and it's really good at conducting electricity and heat. So it's been used um, in um, computer chips and circuits and to make batteries better and for solar cells. Um, and, and this is a, a really um, up and coming type of a um, research um, solid that's used in, in lots of different kinds of, of applications. So when we talk about um, molecular solids, molecular solids have molecules at their lattice points. And the molecules are um, being held together by intramolecular forces, either the London dispersion forces or the dipole-dipole forces or the hydrogen bonding that we talked about before. So if we were to look at carbon dioxide, okay, carbon dioxide might be an example of a molecular solid where the neutral carbon dioxide molecules are at the lattice points. Um, iodine could be an example, I2 being at those um, lattice points. Um, when we look at, um, let's say ice, okay, ice is an example of a molecular solid where those H2O um, molecules are at the lattice points. Or if we were to look at um, table sugar, okay, um, that has um, sugar molecules at its lattice points. So to kind of summarize all of that up, again, we've got kind of two categories of solids. We've got crystalline solids and we've got amorphous solids. Crystalline solids are made up of very um, organized repeating patterns um, called unit cells. And unit cells have those lattice points. And depending on what's in the lattice point determines the type of solid we're looking at. So we've got ionic, we've got atomic, and we've got molecular, okay? Ionic is when we have ions um, at our lattice points, Metallic and um, network covalent is when we have atoms at our lattice points, and molecular is when we have molecules at our lattice points. That kind of just summarizes that all up. So all the solids we went over, they're all crystalline solids. These are all crystalline solids. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep. So when we look at solids, they're either crystalline or amorphous. Amorphous because it's it's not very organized, really doesn't get subdivided any more than that, but crystalline solids do. And this is how we would kind of classify crystalline solids. Yep. All right, so let's just look a little bit more at those unit cells and then we'll move on. We'll be done with chapter 10 and, and go on to chapter 11. So when we look at crystalline solids, okay, they have those unit cells that are used to describe them. They're classified um, by you know, what their unit cells look like. And the unit cells are basically of three different types. Okay, we have what are called simple cubic, body-centered, 
and face centered. Okay, so simple cubic has um, four atoms on the top and four atoms on the bottom of the, um, uh, the unit cell. Body centered has an atom in the middle and then it has um, along the lattice points. And then um, the face centered actually has uh, ones along the lattice points and ones along the sides or the faces of the unit cell. So when we talk about um, efficiency, okay, how well the atoms are packed into the unit cell, we would just take the volume of the atoms and divide it by the volume of the whole cell and multiply it by 100. And simple cubic systems, simple cubic unit cells are the least efficient, only about a little more than half of the space in uh, the unit cell of a simple cubic system is actually made up of particle. About half of it is made up of empty space. And when we talk about, um, oh, I thought I was gonna sneeze. Oh, sorry. Um, when we talk about the um, unit cells, one of the things that's considered is what's called the coordination number. And the coordination number is just the number of atoms that are coming in contact with the atom that we're looking at. And for simple cubic um, systems, the coordination number is six. So if we're looking at a simple cubic um, unit cell, and this is our cell here, or the cell of interest, it's connected to one, two, three, four, five, six other atoms. So the coordination number is six. So this is another depiction of just the unit cell itself. So if we look at a simple unit cell, again, we have an atom here, 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 and here on the top, and then four on the bottom, but only a fraction of that atom is actually part of this unit cell, okay? Some of it's gonna be in the cell above and the cell on the side, okay? If we look at this one here, again, we've got the corner points, but we've got the central atom as well. And if we look here, we've got the central atom, but we also have corners, and we have sides. So if we wanted to analyze a unit cell, okay, let's say this is the unit cell that we're looking at, the repeating um, unit of sodium chloride, okay, and this is our unit of interest here, okay, our atom of interest. Again, the coordination number is six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, and the kind of bluish colored circles are sodium ions and the greenish ones are chloride ions. What we would notice is that oh, this sodium here is in the center. So this uh, ion here, the whole thing is part of the unit cell. If we were to look at the ones that are on the sides or the faces, we're essentially cutting that ion in half. Half of it would be associated with this unit cell. The other half would be associated with the unit cell next to it. If we were to look at the um, edges here, okay, those are gonna be divided into quarters. One quarter of this sodium ion is associated with this unit cell but one quarter would be associated with the unit cell next to it. And one quarter would be associated with the two that are below it. So this ion gets divided into four. So this unit cell would only have one quarter of this ion. If we were to look at the corners, okay, the corners actually get cut in eighths. So this unit cell only has one eighth of this chloride ion. The other seven eighths would go with the unit cells that are adjacent to the unit cell of interest. So if we were to look at it in this case here, way inside here, we have a sodium ion that would be counted as one. 
if we were to look on the faces, we have one on the top, one on the bottom, and four along each side. So there are six on the faces of this unit cell. And each of them is one half of the chloride ion. And then if we were to look at the corners, okay, the edges are the edges, the edges are one quarter of each sodium. And if we were to look at the chlorides, they're one eighth of each chloride ion. So looking at sodium chloride, okay, we have six faces, one on the top, one on the bottom and four around the middle. And we've got eight corners. So for chloride, we've got six faces and one half of each chloride is within that unit cell. So that gives us three. We've got eight corners and each of them has one eighth of a chloride. So that gives us one chloride. So this unit cell has one chloride in it. If we were to look at the sodiums, one of the sodium ions is in the middle. And 12 of them are along the edges. So one quarter of 12 is three. Three plus one gives us four. The ratio of chloride to sodium is four to four or one to one in our unit cell. So when we go to count atoms in a simple cubic, which is what we have here, we have eight corners and one eighth of each corner is in our unit cell. So we have one atom or ion per unit cell. If we were to look at a body-centered cubic unit cell, we have almost the same thing we had for the cubic, except that we also have that atom or ion in the center. So the total number of atoms that we would find in a body-centered cubic unit cell is two. And if we were to look at a face-centered unit cell, there isn't any atom way in the middle there of that unit cell, but there are eight corners, each containing one eighth of an atom or an ion. And there are six sides, each containing half of the atom or the ion. So a face centered unit cell has four atoms in it. And that kind of helps to show why the simple cubic unit cell is the least efficient, whereas the face-centered cubic cell is the most efficient way that atoms or ions are arranged in a crystalline solid. Now, um, that's all we're doing for chapter 10. And we went through the unit cells and the different types of unit cells fairly quickly. It's not a huge part of the content of the course. You do have a little bit of homework you have to do on it, but it, it's, not, it's not a focus of the course, but we, we did wanna kind of go through it. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna switch gears and we're gonna go on to um, chapter 11. So chapter 10 dealt with solids and liquids. Chapter 12 or chapter 11 is going to deal with solutions and colloids. So when we talk about a solution, a solution is defined as a homogeneous mixture. Okay. It's going to be made up of two or more substances. And when we look at solutions, there are two components. We have the solvent. Okay, which is a substance that's usually in the greatest amount. And we have the solute, which is everything else that would be in the solution. And sometimes there's only one solute. Sometimes we may have more than one solute in a solution. So this is just a picture here. We've got um, a solid here. Okay, this is potassium dichromate. We have some water here. 
When we take the potassium dichromate and we dissolve it into the water, we make a solution of potassium dichromate. Now, there are all different types of solutions. The, the classic one that we think about is when we have a solid dissolved in a liquid. We have sodium chloride dissolved in water, salt dissolved in water, okay? But there are all different kinds of solutions. We could talk about um, mixtures of gases, okay? The air that we breathe is a mixture, okay? It's made up primarily of nitrogen gas, but then there are all the other gas mixed in with the nitrogen gas. And all those other gases are the solute component of air. And oxygen is the major solute in air. Okay, when we talk about sodas, soft drinks, okay, that's carbon dioxide, which is a gas, dissolved in water, which is a liquid. Okay, if we talk about hydrogen in a palladium, that's a gas dissolved in a solid. Okay, we could have water and alcohol mixed together to make rubbing alcohol. That's two liquids in a solution. Or we could have um, two solids like zinc and copper can be mixed together in a solution. It's called an alloy. Brass is a, a mixture of zinc and copper. And when we look at solutions, solutions have the following traits. Okay, they're homogeneous or homogeneous. And what that essentially means is after the solute or solutes have dissolved in the solvent, it's a uniform composition. The solute is evenly distributed within that solvent. Okay, the um, solution is typically the state that the solvent was in, solid, liquid, or gas. The components of the solution are um, mixed up or dispersed at the molecular level. Okay, the atoms, the molecules, the atoms are evenly distributed um, within that solution. And if we were to let a solution sit for a period of time, the solute isn't going to separate or settle out from the solvent. Uh, and the composition of a solution okay, can vary. Okay, we can have solutions that are very concentrated, meaning we have a lot of solute relative to the amount of solvent. We could have solutions that are very diluted, meaning we have a very little amount of solute relative to the amount of solvent. So we need to talk about how we make solutions and the energy that's associated with that. So when we talk about making solutions, we're looking at spontaneous processes, which means that the solution is gonna be formed whether energy is added in or not. And when we talk about solutions being formed, okay, they're favored, but not necessarily guaranteed when we have a decrease in the internal energy of the system. In other words, energy is released, or we're looking at an exothermic process, or we're increasing the entropy or the disorder in the system. And we're gonna spend more time on this disorder in the next chapter. So an ideal solution is a solution that forms where there's essentially no energy change. In other words, the strength of the intermolecular forces between the solute and the solvent particles in the solution is the same as the intermolecular forces between the solute particles by themselves and the solvent particles by themselves. So a good example of an ideal solution might be taking two ideal gases and mixing them together or taking two liquids that are very similar structurally and mixing them together. So here we've got some helium and we've got some argon in a closed valve. And if we were to open up uh, the valve, 
the some of the argon will move into this container and some of the helium will move into this container and eventually we will have an even distribution of helium and argon and that process would take place spontaneously. Now, energy. There's three things that are going to need to take place in order for us to make a solution. The first thing that has to happen is the solute particles have to kind of get spread out. We have to break some of the intermolecular forces that are holding the solute particles together. And we kind of expand those solute particles. That's an endothermic process. We have to add energy in in order to prepare the solute to dissolve in the solvent. What also has to occur, and these all occur simultaneously, but what has to occur next is the solvent particles also have to expand. Some intermolecular forces have to break. The solvent particles have to spread out so that there's room for the solute particles to fit in between. And again, because we're breaking intermolecular forces, this is an endothermic process. We have to add energy in. So we're adding energy in to get the solute ready to dissolve. We have to add energy in to get the solvent ready to dissolve the solute. And then the last thing are the solute particles and the solvent particles are going to interact with each other. They're going to form new intermolecular forces between the solute and the solvent particles. And the forming of those intermolecular forces gives off energy. It's an exothermic process. So how much energy do we have to add in compared to how much energy do we get back is what's going to determine whether or not the dissolving process overall is endothermic or exothermic. So when we talk about making a solution spontaneously, it's favored by that exothermic dissolution of the solute particles into the solvent particles. So we kind of have this graphical representation here. So the first thing, oops, oh, pushing the wrong button. Okay. So the first thing that happens is we're going to add some energy in to prepare the solvent to dissolve. Okay. That's going to have a positive delta H value. We're going to add some energy in to prepare the solute to dissolve. That's going to have a positive delta H value. So now the solvent particles are ready to dissolve the solute. The solute particles are ready to dissolve in the solvent. So now we make our solution. We're going to get a lot of energy back when the solute particles and the solvent particles interact with each other. Our enthalpy change is going to be negative because it's an exothermic process. In an exothermic dissolving process, the sum of the energy that we have to add in to get the solute and the solvent prepared to dissolve is going to be less than the amount of energy we get back when the solution actually forms. And that's where we get that enthalpy of solution value. So the energy of the solution is lower than what the solute and the solvent were separately. And the dissolution process is driven by the fact that we're losing energy, we're lowering the energy, and we're increasing the disorder in the system. The particles are more disordered in the solution than they were when they were just the solvent and the solute separately. Now, when we look at this process, the spontaneous solution formation is favored, but it's not guaranteed. While many soluble compounds do dissolve and release heat, some don't. Perfect example, if you've ever used um, an instant cold pack, okay, something that you have um, maybe in a first aid kit, 
essentially what it is, is there is a packet of water, okay? And then outside that, there's a compound like ammonium nitrate. And when you break the water in this bag, the ammonium nitrate dissolves in the water. And this is an endothermic process. It absorbs energy from the surroundings. That makes the surroundings feel colder. Okay, your ankle that you sprained is going to feel colder because energy is going to be absorbed from your ankle into the cold pack. Now, we've seen, we've talked about in Chem 1 or in, in other classes that you've taken, this, this kind of saying, like dissolves like. And that's a general rule for what kind of solute dissolves in a given solvent. So when we talk about solvent-solute interactions, it's dependent on what kind of solute and what kind of solvent we're dealing with. Materials that have similar intermolecular forces tend to be soluble in each other. So a nonpolar solute will dissolve in a nonpolar solvent or a polar solute will dissolve in a polar solvent because they have similar intermolecular forces. Substances dissolve when the solvent-solute attraction is stronger than the original solvent-solvent and the original solute-solute forces. So an example, oil, is a nonpolar solute, okay? It only has London dispersion forces. Well, water is a polar solvent. It has hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. So we have nonpolar and polar trying to mix together. Oil and water don't mix because they don't have similar intermolecular forces. Ethanol has hydrogen bonding and water has hydrogen bonding. Ethanol dissolves in water because they have similar intermolecular forces. Now, how do polar molecules dissolve in polar solvents like water? So here's an example. Let's say we've got some polar solute. Okay, it doesn't really matter what it is. We should remember that polar substances have an uneven distribution of electrons due to differences in electronegativities for the atoms in that substance. So in this case, we've got a polar solute. Okay, whatever's over here is more electronegative than what's over here. So we've got a partial negative side to our molecule here, and we've got a partial positive side to our molecule here. Well, when we look at water molecules, this is a water molecule, H2O, okay? This is an intramolecular force. It's a polar covalent bond. This is a polar covalent bond. It's what's holding the hydrogens to the oxygen. But oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen is, so the electrons are going to get pulled closer to the oxygen. So this side of our water molecule is partially negative. This side is partially positive. So why does a polar solute dissolve in water? Because we're going to have interactions between the negative side of the polar solute and the positive side of the water. And we'll have interactions between the positive side of our polar solute and the negative side of water, because unlike charges attract each other. Now, when we talk about this process, we're looking at what's called salvation, okay? It's just a general term for when a solute is dissolved into a solvent and the solvent essentially surrounds that solute particles. When the solvent is water, it just has a special name. It's called hydration. Now, what we need to know is that 
Um, when we look at molecules that dissolve in water, okay, bonds are not broken when molecules dissolve, okay? Um, this molecule here, this polar solute stays intact if it's a molecule and it just gets attracted to the negative and the positive portion of the water molecule. Now, some terms. Hydrophilic means water loving, okay? What it really means is that that solute is attracted to water. Hydrophobic means water fearing, literally, but it means that it repels water. So some examples, if we were to look at um, vitamin A, okay, here's the structure of vitamin A, okay? It's a mostly nonpolar molecule. Water's polar. So that means vitamin A isn't gonna be attracted to water molecules. So vitamin A is hydrophobic. What it will do though, is it will dissolve in fatty tissues in our body because fats are nonpolar, like dissolves like. Now, if we were to look at vitamin C, vitamin C has a much different structural arrangement. It is a more polar molecule. Okay, we've got this OH here and this OH here and this OH here and this OH here, and we've got these oxygens with lone pairs of electrons. So we've got a very polar molecule. Again, water is polar. So vitamin C is hydrophilic. Vitamin C is gonna be attracted to water molecules because they have similar intermolecular forces. Vitamin C dissolves in water. So vitamin C can easily circulate in our blood and it can easily circulate between the cells in the intracellular fluid. Now, when we talk about alcohols, okay, we can um, look at the relationship between alcohols and water, okay, how alcohols will dissolve in water. So here we have a little table. These are all different alcohols, okay? A couple of things we should notice, okay? Um, all of the formulas have this OH group in it. So we've got an OH here, and we've got an OH here, and we've got an OH here. That's the functional group that classifies these molecules as alcohols. And within this molecule, this is a methanol molecule, we've got hydrogen bonded to oxygen, which means that we're gonna have hydrogen bonding in this methanol, between methanol molecules, okay? And water is um, also polar. So methanol is very soluble in water, okay? Ethanol is very soluble in water. Propanol is very soluble in water. But once we start getting down here, the molecules are getting bigger and bigger. As we go from butanol to pentanol to hexanol to heptanol, we're adding more to the hydrocarbon chain of the alcohol. This part of the molecule is very nonpolar. So the more nonpolar we have in our alcohol, the less it's going to dissolve in water. So heptanol, which has a very long hydrocarbon chain, which is nonpolar, is only marginally dissolved in water. Now, C6H14, okay, this is a nonpolar solvent. It's called hexane or cyclohexane. Well, if this is nonpolar and like dissolves like, well, methanol only marginally dissolves in cyclohexane. But as we go down these alcohols, the structure is becoming more and more nonpolar, and the alcohol is becoming more and more soluble in the nonpolar solvent. 
So smaller alcohols dissolve easily in water due to the hydrogen bonds between the water molecules and the, this is called the hydroxyl group, this OH, in the alcohol. The London dispersion forces in the alcohol are insignificant because there isn't much nonpolar in those smaller alcohols. But when we look at the larger alcohols, the long chain alcohols have a lot more London forces in them and they don't dissolve in water. Um, cyclohexane, okay, or C6H14, okay, will have strong London dispersion forces with most alcohols and will dissolve. And again, we just need to remember that if we were to take um, methanol and dissolve it in water, we're not gonna break the intramolecular forces within this molecule. What we do break are the intermolecular forces between these molecules. And then we reform intermolecular forces between the alcohol and the water or the alcohol and the um, cyclohexane. All right, so electrolytes, okay? Um, Non-electrolytes are substances that um, do not break up into ions when they dissolve. And we call them non-electrolytes because since there are no ions present in the solution, it can't conduct an electric current. But if we were to look at um, electrolytes, electrolytes are substances that dissolve in water. And when they dissolve in water, they do break up into ions. And the presence of ions in the solution allows that solution to conduct an electric current. And that's why we call it an electrolyte. Now, there are different degrees of electrolytes. Strong electrolytes are ones in which pretty much 100% of the compound breaks up into ions when it dissolves. Weak electrolytes form when only a very small percentage of the molecules break up into their ions. Now, we're gonna watch just a real quick video and then we're gonna take a quick break. So let's see if I can get this to work. Okay, so what we have here, here's a light bulb. It is plugged into an outlet, okay? And if we touch it to a metal, it can conduct an electric current. Now, what we're gonna see, I'll stop it here for a second. Oops, go back just a little bit. Okay, so what we have here Okay, if we were to take this bulb, again, it's already plugged into an outlet, and we were to put it into water, we're not completing the circuit. So we can't conduct an electric current. If we were to take this um, bulb and put it in contact with aluminum, metals can conduct an electric current. So we're completing the circuit and the bulb lights. If we were to take this setup and put it into sugar or put it into salt or put it into silicon dioxide, we don't complete the circuit and the bulb doesn't light. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna add some water. Now we know that water isn't gonna allow that current to flow. So we're gonna put some water in with our aluminum. We'll put it in with our, this is sucrose, you know, sugar that you maybe put in your coffee. We're gonna put it in with the salt. We're gonna put it in with the um, silicon dioxide, and we're going to make some solutions. Now, the aluminum doesn't even dissolve. So what we're going to see now is because the aluminum doesn't dissolve in the water, we're not going to be able to conduct an electric current. Now, the sugar does dissolve in the water, but the C12H22O11 stays in its molecular form. It doesn't break up into ions in solution. And since there are no ions in the solution, the electric current can't flow. We haven't completed the circuit. So we would say that this is a non-electrolyte. 
Sodium chloride, on the other hand, when it dissolves in water, it's table salt, it breaks up into sodium ions and chloride ions. That hydration process takes place that we looked at before. And because we have ions in the solution, we can conduct an electric current. So sodium chloride is an electrolyte. And then silicon dioxide is a lot like the sucrose we had over there. Um, it actually doesn't even really dissolve. So there's no ions in solution. We're not gonna have um, a completed circuit and we're not gonna be able to conduct an electric current. So the sugar here is dissolving, but it's not forming ions. So it's considered to be a non-electrolyte. The sodium chloride here is dissolving and forming ions. So it's considered to be an electrolyte. So what we're gonna do, it's about a quarter after. So let's just do that, okay. So let's take um, a couple minute break. Let's come back just a couple minutes after 7.20. Um, go to the bathroom if you need to, get a drink if you need to, take a stretch for a couple minutes, and then we're gonna come back and start looking at some math. So um, if you don't have a calculator out, you're gonna wanna get yourself a calculator as well. So we'll take maybe a four or five minute break real quick, and then we'll come back and we'll continue where we left off. And if anybody has any questions during our break, we can you know, talk about anything you wanna talk about. All right, another minute or two, we'll get ourselves started back up again. Hopefully you got a chance to get a, a little stretch in there. All right, my friends, so we're gonna get ourselves started back up again. Um, so what we want to do, 
now is just talk about this um, dissociation process. So when ionic compounds dissolve in water, the ions in the solids separate. They disperse uniformly throughout the sol solution. Remember that it's a homogeneous mixture. And the reason it does that is because the, the water molecules surround and solvate um, the ions. Um, and it essentially prevents the ions from sticking to each other. So water and other polar molecules are attracted to ions through ion dipole interactions. So if we look at this picture here, okay, this is depicting sodium chloride. So we've, or sorry, potassium chloride. So we've got potassium ions and chloride ions. And in the solid state, the potassium ions are attracted to the chloride ions and the potassium ions are attracted to the chloride ions and so forth. But if we were to take this crystalline solid and put it into water, okay, the water molecules are gonna move in. The positive end of the water molecule would be attracted to the negative ions and the negative side of the water molecules will be attracted to the positive ions and they essentially just pluck the ions out and surround them. So the chloride ion will be surrounded by um, the positive end of the water molecules, the potassiums will be surrounded by the negative um, ends of the water molecules. And then what can't happen are the potassium ions and the chloride ions really can't interact with each other anymore because they've been surrounded with water molecules. Okay, if we were to look down here, just a, a different illustration, we've got you know sodium chloride. We look at the chloride, it would be surrounded by the positive ends of the water molecule here. Okay, if we were to look at the sodium, it would be surrounded by the negative side of the water molecules here. Now, when we look at um, electrolytes, sometimes covalent compounds can dissolve in water and conduct an electric current. This shouldn't be here, but, um, but the reason isn't because the ions are necessarily there to begin with. It's because there's a chemical reaction that takes place between the solute and the solvent. So as an example, Here's water. Okay, this is a um, Lewis structure for water. And we've got hydrogen chloride. And if we were to take hydrogen chloride and put it into water, a chemical reaction takes place. The hydrogen from this um, hydrogen chloride is going to leave the hydrogen chloride because it's so highly attracted to these lone pairs of electrons. And it's going to form ions. Because there are ions that are in the solution after this covalent compound dissolves in water, it's an electrolyte. Okay. Now, hydrogen chloride is an acid. And the way that acids react with water is something that we're going to be spending um, quite a bit of time on um, later on in, in this um, course. I'm going to spend um, a couple chapters actually talking about that kind of stuff. So next let's talk about solubility. And solubility is the maximum concentration that can be formed by a solution um, at a particular temperature. So if we have solid sodium chloride and we put it into water, okay, it's an ionic compound. It's gonna break up into ions. We're gonna form sodium ions and chloride ions. And as time continues, more sodium chloride dissolves into the ions. But as the concentration of the ions in the solution increases, what will start to happen is some of those ions will stick back together and reform the solid. And we're eventually going to form an equilibrium between the rate of dissolving of the solid and the rate of precipitating of the ions. And at that point, we've reached what's called equilibrium. And the amount of sodium chloride that has dissolved at equilibrium is what we mean when we talk about solubility. So some terms. When we talk about a saturated solution, 
a saturated solution has the maximum amount of solute dissolved in it. So the solute's concentration is equal to its solubility. But if we have an unsaturated solution, we don't have enough solute dissolved in the solution. So the solute's concentration would be less than that solubility or that maximum concentration. And we can have what's called supersaturated solutions. Okay, those are ones that you kind of have to force them to be made. Um, and they're super unstable and they tend to um, go back down to their saturation point fairly quickly. Um, but you can kind of force a solution to dissolve more than it should um, at a particular temperature. So if we were to look at um, a graphical representation of this, Okay, we have um, the solubility along the y-axis and the solubility is just the grams of solute for every 100 grams of water. And we have the temperature along the um, x-axis. This line here is our saturation point. Okay, this is the maximum amount of solute that can dissolve at various temperatures. If we have less than this amount, we have an unsaturated solution. And if we have more than that amount, we have a supersaturated solution. So let's look at gases. Okay, so we have our solubility here. Okay, so how much solute is dissolved in our solution? And we have our temperature here. And what we should notice is for gases, as the temperature goes up, the solubility goes down. And it has to do with the intermolecular forces between the solute particles and the solvent particles. So the solubility of gases decreases as the temperature increases. Now, there are lots of environmental implications to that. Let me give you one. Um, there's something called thermal pollution. So um, most power plants are built along some kind of a water supply. And the reason that they do that is so that the um, power plant can use that external water source to cool it down. So we have a power plant, it's next to a river or lake, um, and it takes water out of that uh, river or lake, um, and it uses it to cool down the power plant, and then it pumps the warmer water back out into the environment. There's no poisons in that water, but the temperature is slightly different. And what happens is as the temperature goes up, the solubility for oxygen gas goes down. So when the water is a little bit warmer, it can't dissolve as much oxygen anymore. And aquatic life that lives in that water and relies on the oxygen dissolved in the water actually end up suffocating. So it's called thermal pollution and it's very regulated now. It wasn't back in the 70s and 80s, but it's, it's certainly something that um, has been studied um, and, and has, has been regulated over the years. The other thing that affects um, the solubility of gases in liquids is the pressure. So when we look at um, pressures, if we were to increase the pressure, that's going to increase the solubility. So we have an equation here, and we're going to need our calculators for the first time here. Um, we're looking at what's called Henry's law. And Henry's law essentially says that the solubility of a gas in a liquid is directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gas above that liquid. So here, okay, this is the molarity of the gas, the moles per liter. The K is just the proportionality constant that allows us to have an equation. 
and our P sub G is the partial pressure of the gas. So as we increase the partial pressure of the gas, we increase the concentration. They're directly proportional. So let's look at an example. Okay, it says a soft drink is bottled so that the uh, bottle at 25 degrees Celsius contains carbon dioxide, that's the carbonation, at a pressure of 5.0 atm over the liquid. Assume that the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is only 0 0.00040 atm. Calculate the equilibrium concentration, so we're trying to calculate C, for carbon dioxide in the soda at 25 degrees Celsius when it's been closed, and then after we open the bottle. And think about that. When you have a, a, a soda bottle and you open it up, you know, it makes that sound. Okay, that's because the um, solubility of the carbon dioxide is going down because the partial pressure above the liquid has gone down. So we're going to be using a Henry's law. Okay, the C stands for the concentration. That's what we're trying to figure out in this particular question. The partial pressure of the carbon dioxide is given to us above the liquid when the can is, or the bottle is closed. And then when the bottle is open, it would be equal to the atmosphere. And then it gives us what the constant, the proportionality constant K would be. So we wanna find out what would the concentration of carbon dioxide be when our bottle is closed? And then what's the concentration of the carbon dioxide in the bottle after it's been opened? Okay, so I'll give you a minute, see if you can calculate those two values. Make sure when you're doing these problems, you write down the equation and then you plug in the numbers with the units and then you get your answer and your answer should have the right number of significant digits and it should have units to go along with it. Okay, so practice, you know, when we do these problems together, practice them kind of like you're looking at a test. Okay, just so that, you know, practice makes permanent the way that you you know, do things in class is going to be the way that you're going to be doing them in, um, you know, on a test. All right, so let's look at the first one. Okay, we can calculate the concentration of the carbon dioxide in the unopened bottle by taking the proportionality constant, which was that 3.1 times 10 to the minus two moles per liter ATM, and multiplying it by the um, partial pressure of the carbon dioxide above the liquid in the closed bottle. Okay, now a couple of things. Notice that I wrote the numbers and the units, which is something I would wanna see on your test. So our proportionality constant is moles per liter ATM. We're gonna multiply that by ATMs, the ATMs cancel out. That's where we're left with moles per liter or molarity, which is the units for concentration. And we have two significant digits in our proportionality constant, and we have two significant digits in our pressure. So we're gonna have two significant digits in our concentration. Now, in the open one, the proportionality constant is the same, but the pressure of the carbon dioxide above the liquid is significantly lower. And when we go to calculate our molarity, the concentration of the carbon dioxide in the liquid, we're going to notice that that value is significantly lower as well. And again, you know, two significant digits here, two significant digits here. So I'm rounding this to two significant digits. And it would be better to write this number in scientific notation. We wouldn't write 0 0.000012 for an answer. Move that decimal five places. And that's where that 1.2 times 10 to the minus five comes from. Okay, so 
a soda bottle that's closed is going to be carbonated. One that's opened is going to lose its carbonation. Okay, questions on uh, Henry's Law? Okay, so a couple more terms. When we say um, we're looking at liquids that are um, miscible, okay, we're saying that um, they are substances that um, will um, mix with other substances. When we say something is immiscible, okay, we're saying that the liquids don't mix together. And then we could have things that are kind of in between. We could say that they're partially miscible. Okay, so now let's look at another solubility curve. So we've got solubility along the y-axis and we have temperature along the x-axis, but now we're looking at solids, okay? Generally speaking, for solids, as the temperature goes up, the solubility goes up, okay? Now there are some exceptions like uh, the cerium, three sulfate, as the temperature goes up, the solubility goes down. But generally speaking, as the temperature goes up, the solubility for solids increases. Now, <clears throat> sorry, um, when we look at um, supersaturated solutions, okay, um, an example of that might be a hand warmer. So a hand warmer is prepared by warming up a solution, okay, and then dissolving a lot of solute in it, and then cooling it back down. Well, the solubility goes down when the temperature goes down, but if the solute's already dissolved in there, it may tend to stay dissolved. And if it does tend to stay dissolved, you have what's called a supersaturated solution but it is not stable at all. And really, if you were to just shake it, okay, that's gonna cause the solute particles, which are above the saturation point to precipitate out of that solution. All right, now we're gonna get into colligative properties. And before we talk about specifics, we're gonna be dealing with calculations for concentrations. But when we look at colligative properties, okay, they are properties that depend only on the concentration of the solute. How much solute is dissolved in the solution? It doesn't matter what the solute actually is. So vapor pressure is a colligative property. Boiling point is a colligative property. Freezing point is a colligative property. If we add a solute to a solvent, it lowers the vapor pressure. And if we add a solute to a solvent, it raises the boiling point. And if we add a solute to a solvent, it lowers the freezing point. So these are, oh, there's another one, sorry. Osmotic pressure is also. <clears throat> these are examples of colligative properties that depend on the concentration of the solute, but the identity of the solute is insignificant. It doesn't matter what it is, it just matters how much there is. So we're going to spend some time and look at concentrations first, and then we're going to apply them to those colligative properties. And colligative properties um, play important roles in, in lots of different things, whether naturally or uh, in lab applications. So let's uh, look at concentrations. The first one should be very familiar, okay, molarity. When we deal with molarity, molarity is a unit of concentration that deals with the moles of solute per liter of solution. So our equation would look something like this. We're going to use a capital M for molarity. 
molarity equals the moles of solute per liter of solution. Now, maybe we're given grams of solute and we have to remember how to do a gram to mole conversion. We need the molar mass to do that. Maybe we given the milliliters of the solution and we'd have to convert it to liters, knowing that there are a thousand milliliters per liter. Or maybe we're given the grams of the solution and the density of that solution and we can calculate the volume of the solution. So one way we can deal with concentration is in terms of molarity, moles of solute, per liter of solution. Another way we can deal with concentration is in terms of what's referred to as mole fraction. And the symbol for mole fraction is an X. It's more of a italicized X, but an X is fine. And it's essentially the ratio of the moles of the component that we're looking at to the total moles of um, components that are in the solution. So mole fraction, if we had, let's say, a solution that contained A and B, the mole fraction of A would be the moles of A divided by the moles of A plus the moles of B, the total moles in the solution. Molality kind of looks like molarity. It's actually just one letter different. And molality is another way of talking about the concentration of a solution, but it's slightly different. Molality deals with the moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. So two things are different between molarity and molality. Okay, molarity is liters of solution. Molality is kilograms of solvent. So they're just a little bit different. So remember that the solid is the substance that dissolves, the one that you have less of. The solvent is the substance the solute dissolves in, the one that you have more of. And the solution is what you make when the solute dissolves in the solvent. Now, we're going to use a lowercase m to stand for molality. So we're differentiating molarity from molality with a capital M or a lowercase m. So molality is moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. And what we have to be able to do is not just singly calculate one of these concentrations, but we have to be able to go back and forth from one unit of concentration to another. So we're going to do some practice problems on that. So the first question here talks about antifreeze. And antifreeze is a mixture of um, a substance called ethylene glycol and water. And there are some other things that are in there as well, but those are the two main components that, that we're going to focus on. We're going to want to calculate the mole fraction and the molality of our solution if we make the solution by dissolving 2.22 times 10 to the third grams of ethylene glycol in 2.00 times 10 to the three grams of water. Okay, now the ethylene glycol is the solute and the wa if water's in the question, water is the solvent. Okay, so mole fraction means we need to know the moles of the solute and the total moles in the solution. So step number one is going to be to convert moles of ethylene, or sorry, grams of ethylene glycol to moles. Now to do that, we would need a periodic table and we'd have to calculate the molar mass for ethylene glycol. Now, I certainly wouldn't expect that you know the formula for ethylene glycol, it's given to you in the question, okay? So we'll do this one together. 
We have 2.22 times 10 to the third grams of ethylene glycol, and we want to convert it to moles. Well, if I use the periodic table and take carbon times two plus hydrogen times four plus oxygen times two plus hydrogen times two, that would give me my molar mass. So the molar mass for ethylene glycol is 62.08 grams per mole. Okay, I'm just assuming, you know, that we know how to do that, we'll do a quick review of it. So 2.22 times 10 to the third grams is equal to 35.8 moles. Okay, notice the way this is set up because this is how I want you to show your work. Okay, the more logical you show your work, the more likely you're gonna get the right answers. Okay, so we're converting from grams to moles by using our molar mass. We have two significant digits here. We want two significant digits here. So using this as a model, convert 2.00 times 10 to the third grams of water to moles. Okay, water's H2O. If you don't have a periodic table in front of you, I'll tell you that um, water is 18.02 grams per mole. Okay, the molar mass for water is 18.02 grams per mole. So take 2.00 times 10 to the third grams of water, model it the way I did this problem here, and calculate how many moles of water we have. <clears throat> Two point zero zero has two significant digits, so you're going to want two significant digits in your answer. Okay, so I'm getting 111 moles of water. Okay, all right, so now we have the information we need to calculate mole fraction. Remember that mole fraction is the moles of the component, which is the ethylene glycol, over the total moles in the solution. Oops, so I don't want to do that. So calculate your mole fraction, okay? Moles of ethylene glycol over the moles of ethylene glycol plus the moles of water. And that's what we would call our mole fraction of ethylene glycol. And make sure, you know, don't just watch what I'm doing and say, oh, I can do that. Do the problem yourself. That's how you're gonna know you, you know how to do it or you're gonna know what questions you need to ask so that you don't get stuck when you're working on your homework. All right, so I get 0. 0.224, sorry, 244 for my mole fraction of ethylene glycol in my solution. Now it really means 24.4% if we wanted to multiply it by 100, but we're just gonna leave it in its decimal form. I don't remember if I want you to do the other one. Okay, so now calculate the molality. Okay, there are no units for mole fraction. Thank you for that question. Yep, there are no units for mole fraction. So molality, write down your equation, plug in your numbers, and then get your answer. So molality is that lowercase m, and it's moles of solute, which is your ethylene glycol, divided by your kilograms of solvent. The solvent's water, you're giving it in grams, you're gonna to need to divide by a thousand to get to kilograms. <clears throat> okay. 
Okay, so I'm getting 17.9. Now, we can write it as 17.9 moles per kilogram. We could do that. But we could also just use this lowercase m, and that's what that stands for. So it's a 17.9 molal solution. Okay, the key to it was, you know, what are we given and what do we need to convert that to so that we can get what we're asked for? So let's try another one, okay? A little bit more involved, okay? This time, it tells us that we have an aqueous solution Okay, actually for this question, it doesn't really matter what it is. So we have an, oh, it says it's glucose. We have an aqueous solution that's 0 0.120 molal glucose. We wanna calculate the mole fraction of each component. Now, unless it states otherwise, the solvent is water. Okay, and I, it's, it's going to be few and far between that you would see a question that has anything other than water as the solvent. Now, the key to this is what does 0.120m mean? Okay, well, if we say that a solution is 0 0.120 molal, it means it contains 0 0.120 moles of solute in every kilogram of water. And that's important. And you should write that down because that's gonna be you know, something that's gonna help you to figure out what to do in the problems. Now, we wanna calculate mole fractions. That means that we're gonna to need to figure out the moles of everything in the solution. Well, it gives us the moles of glucose. So we already have that number. It gives us the kilograms of water, but we need to get that to moles. So use your dimensional analysis, okay? Your factor labeling, show your work, convert 1.00 kilograms of water two moles of water, okay? There are a thousand grams in a kilogram and there's 18.02 grams per mole for water. Once you calculate the moles of water, you have everything you need to figure out your mole fraction for the glucose in the solution and your mole fraction for the water in the solution. And I really want to stress again, you know, the, the showing your work, being logical in the way you do your problems will make the problems much easier. You're making it harder on yourself by taking shortcuts, I guarantee it. So one kilogram is a thousand grams, 1.00 times 10 to the third grams. And there's 18.02 grams per mole so we've got 55.6 moles of water. So we know the moles of glucose. We know the moles of water. We can figure out the mole fraction of glucose and we can figure out the mole fraction of water in that solution, okay? Once you get your mole fraction of the water, just put it into the, um, into the chat so I know that you're done and then we'll put them up there and go around. Okay, moles of glucose over the total will give you the mole fraction for glucose. Moles of water over the total will give you the mole fraction for water.
And once you get that mole fraction for water, just put it into the chat so that I can kind of time myself knowing that we can go over it. All right, so we got some in there. Okay, so let's see how we did. So for the mole fraction of glucose, we would take the 0 0.120 moles of glucose and divide it by the 0 0.120 plus 55.6. Super small concentration of glucose in terms of mole fraction. And then when we do the mole fraction for the water, we're gonna see that it's pretty much all water. It's 99.8% or 0.998 uh, water. Now we could check our answer, significant digit wise, it's a little tricky, but um, if we were to add the mole fractions together, they're gonna add up to one. Okay, way for you to kind of check your answer. So let's look at one more. Okay, it says an aqueous solution is 0 0.150 mole fraction glucose. Okay, so this time we're given the mole fraction. What is the molarity of the solution? So the first thing we have to do is we have to say, what does this mean? And define it, okay? It'll make it much easier for you to figure out what you need to do. So if we say that we have a 0 0.150 mole fraction of glucose, it means we have 0 0.150 moles of glucose and 0 0.850 moles of water per mole of solution. It's a ratio, it doesn't really matter what, what numbers we use, but if we have one mole of solution, we would have 0 0.150 moles of glucose and 0 0.850 moles of water. Well, now that we know that, we can figure out the molality. So think about what molality is. Molality is moles of solute. Well, we have that right here. Over kilograms of solvent. Well, we don't have kilograms of solvent. We have moles of solvent. So we're going to have to take that 0 0.850 moles of water and convert it to grams and then convert it to kilograms. And then we can calculate our molality. So go ahead and do that. And when you have it, put it in your chat and we'll see how you did. Again, you're going to have to get that 0 0.850 moles of water to kilograms of water, and then you can calculate your molality. When you think you have it, put it into the chat there so that I know we're ready to move on. All right, so let's see how we did. So first, let's take that 0 0.5850, 5, go from moles to grams. So we've got 15.3 grams of water. You don't necessarily have to show your work. There's a thousand grams per kilogram. So we've got 0 0.0153 kilograms of water, okay? We know the moles, we know the kilograms, we can calculate the molality. And again, show your work, okay? I'm gonna give you full credit only if you have all of your work. If it's kind of you know, half all over the page, it's hard for me to give you much credit. So I wrote down the equation. I plugged in the numbers with the units. I have three significant digits here and three significant digits here. I want three significant digits in my answer. And I can either write it as 9.80, moles per kilogram, or I can say it's a 9.80 molal solution. Just another way of saying the same thing. 
So that is as far as we're going to go for today. Um, do we have any questions on anything we did? Again, mm -hmm. I um, have recorded, so let me stop recording, but it's recorded and I will put it into um, Canvas for you so that you can, you know, if you miss something or want to go back and look at it again, you can do 